All right, hello, Mr. Rooney. My name is Vasilios Kuzmakos. It's part of the Simple Proc World History Program. Today's date is um, September 18th. Um, it is 9.30. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, uh, Vasilios. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. So the first thing I want to start ask, the first thing I want to ask you is uh, um, if you can tell me a little bit about yourself, right? So when and where you were born, and if you can describe your family, I would appreciate it. I was born in St. Petersburg, St. Anthony's Hospital in 1958. I actually grew up in a little area, unincorporated Pinellas County, between St. Petersburg and Pinellas Park. I had six siblings, um, and so uh, we had a pretty big house. Nice. Um, so if you can tell me a little bit more about your um, background, right? So what did you do growing up? Um, in the, so tell me about uh, what, the type of outdoors, um, outdoor activities you kind of did, um, fishing, hunting, et cetera. Well, in those days, we didn't have like AC when we were really young. So we, and you weren't allowed to stay in the house. So you spent most of your time outside. Uh, Pinellas County at that time wasn't all built out like it is now. So there was a lot of fields. There were still rattlesnakes. Um, and dove hunting. And so we hunted and fished. We used to actually uh, hunt coons at Whedon's Island, but it was open for hunting back in those days. So we were outside mainly uh, hunting and fishing and going through fields and creeks and, and whatnot, almost on a daily basis. At every chance we could, we were out. Fantastic. Um... So uh, how did you develop an interest in nature? Was there a specific person um, or event that you kind of linked it to? There probably wasn't a specific individual. We were just always outside. And I don't know if it was like reading Field and Stream and the different magazines and things that were out there. I mean, we were always trying to get something to eat, to be quite honest with you. Um, and to do that, you had to go hunting and fishing. And I mean, pretty much the things that we collected, we brought home and ate, or we ate them out in the yard and a little fire. We used to uh, plink doves and stuff like that. And we'd cook them right there, you know, same with fish, starting with pan fish and whatnot. Great. So, um, if, um, so if you can just tell me a little bit more about your career on um, the city. So what did you do as a career and when did you start? Well, after getting out of the service in 81, I went into construction, industrial construction. I spent about 18 years uh, building large stadiums, uh, sewage treatment plants, power plants, high rise uh, commercial complexes, not houses or strip malls or anything of that nature, just really, really large uh, projects. Um, and then with that, I went on to work for the city of St. Petersburg in 1999 as a building inspector. Um, and with I spent 20 years with them up till uh, 2019. Um, and I was probably the first individual in the city of St. Pete to hold a state EPA license for construction sites and water influence, site containment, erosion control, and so on and so forth. I mean, it was really, in the city's eyes, it was under the Clean Water Act of the 90s, all communities that had pipes or outlets from any storm drain, sewer, whatnot, dumping into navigatable bodies of water like Tampa Bay had to report to the, the federal government what they were doing to clean up the water and, and, and to have the discharges uh, nutrient less and so on and so forth. St. Pete actually dragged its feet and I was sent as a low man on the totem pole, newly hired, because most of the experienced guys wanted nothing to do with it. And at that, that time, in 99, 2000, the city was facing a $300,000 to $500,000 fine by the federal EPA for not implementing. The government wants to see what this city's doing. They don't come out and physically look. They want to see what you have in place. 
you know, how many people you have certified in EPA and uh, how you're managing construction sites is what their focus was. But most things were really the city's pipes leading into the bay. Uh, that was the issue. Um, um, so if we can elaborate on, um, on that a little bit more, right? So, uh, like, so, so, why, so, why were the, so why were the city's pipes? Uh, so number one, what what was the issue? What why were the city why were the city pipes leading out to Tampa Bay? Was it simply the way it was built in the past? And then if you can kind of just speak about uh, kind of what you've seen over the course of your, of, of of twenty years in terms of changing policy and kind of just you know the way leadership has kind of responded to these kind of environmental kind of issues popping up. The municipalities in general, I would say, they drag their feet on these things because they don't want to do any mandates that's not funded by the government. So this had to come out of their pocket, to be honest with you. Um, and the EPA manual that I was giving at the time actually had the letter from the federal government left in it that I was given to by a manager that I read to my wife going, wow, look at this. The city is going to be fined, you know, almost a half a million dollars if they don't get some people qualified and start showing data to the federal government about what we were doing. Now, with that said, um, the water quality had de degraded in Tampa Bay for some time, mostly due to sewage treatment or the untreated sewage that was being outfalled directly into Tampa Bay, which is one of the things the federal uh, government for the Clean Water Act was interested in, was all these outfall pipes. And they were coming directly from sewage treatment plants, you know, partially treated sewage and, and so on and so forth. Now, St. Pete was one of the first and leading cutting edge technology in the treatment of wastewater and then the reuse of wastewater, uh, wastewater for irrigation purposes. And they actually had it hooked up to their fire hydrants and those were the purple fire hydrants in St. Pete. Then the EPA cracked down and I'm going, oh my gosh, you can't use this in that capacity because it would be misconstrued with potable water. And so they had to abandon that, but they were the first to clean water on such a large scale in that regard. And that they have in, 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 in more recent times, because of the system not being a closed system, in other words, all the joints and the pipes that carry your sewage out of an individual home and make its way all the way to a plant, either gravity fed or pumped uphill, these pipes weren't plastic pipe with good seals. They were pipes that were bending and cracking and moving with the earth in the settlement. So they leaked and the stormwater, uh, you know, your manhole covers and whatnot, when you're, when it flooded, your street was full of water. All that water is going down in the manhole, you know, around the lids because it's not a sealed system. So they'd be inundated with stormwater into the sewer system causing them to back up at the plants and then dump into Tampa Bay, partially treated. And then that would then cause issues, probably mostly with red tide and whatnot from those things that happened there. And the city's now got deep wells that they've drilled down uh, to handle that wastewater going out. I think that that's not a problem anymore. The water quality has actually gotten better since like the 60s and 70s, more seagrass and whatnot. Now what you have is storm water, which is the water that comes off your yard, streets, gutter, curb, and so on. So if you can talk about a little bit of the um, so if you can kind of, if you can kind of just give me a better idea of the timeline, right, in terms of just actual years. So, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned that, you know, the storm, that you kind of mentioned that things were kind of bad in St. Pete, you know, in the 70s and 80s, right? But then they started fixing things, right? Um, it's probably the 60s okay. uh, when they were still, and in the 70s, um, in the 70s, they started to build more tanks to hold more, to treat more. You know, I don't know if you're aware, but like uh, Fort DeSoto Park, those bathrooms have been out there probably since the early 60s, late 50s, you know, they're really nice and everything, but they just, 
dump directly into Tampa Bay. Actually, go over that last bridge, boat ramps on the right, the outfall was on the left. I've actually netted mullet standing on the pipe that dumped all that stuff out there. Uh, and so not knowing later on when, you know, as I work with the city, you could see plot sheets and the design. Um, but anyways, and so moving into the, 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 the 80s, they were really getting on board with reclaiming the water and whatnot. It was only big, huge rain events and inundated systems that they could not handle. Now, out there at Tyrone, where my old house was, there, there's a deep well, it's thousands of feet down. So now if this happens, they pump this down into the ground instead of letting it go into the bay. Um, and so they're probably at the best they've ever been now in the 2000s. Uh, of course, they were really ahead on a lot of things, but they want, weren't reporting it to the federal government in that sense. And the bureaucracy of government, there was a lot of missing pages there. Um, and now, they're probably more on the same page because that was in the 90s under Clinton, the Clean Water Act. Uh, but that hasn't changed anything to do with stormwater. That's pre pretty much sewage treatment in that area is probably the best it's ever been. And um, so what do you, why do you think St. Petersburg became a leader in stormwater runoff though? You know, um, was it, and it was a, was it somebody kind of a necessity that they kind of had to deal with? I it mean, it always boils down to the simple thing of monetary gain money. St. Pete and Florida in general, especially that area, is a huge tourist destination by a lot of people. So you can't very well have they wanted clean beaches, they wanted clean environment for money reasons. Maybe there's a small factor in there of people just wanting to see the environment better off. But I would say it's money. Money drives that. Interesting. So uh, um, what, what, what are the most major changes in ecosystem composition have you noticed in your lifetime? So in terms of you know abundance or lack of... Or lack Going of, back to being a kid uh, in the 60s and looking at the lakes that were natural springs and lakes they all had white sand bottoms um and in and around a lot of saltwater areas you had marsh and whatnot um but you had pretty good water clarity and i'll just stick with the fresh water to start with and it just all the pipes for storm water streets gutter curb just went directly into it and anytime you have water meeting land, and it's not a natural process, in other words, flowing down through all kinds of native vegetation and stuff to clear out things, this is just a pipe dumping it straight into the, the little, and what we've seen is in the composition of the, bo the, the bottoms, uh, the white sand turned to a gray, almost cement-like if you was to dry it out, material that covered the bottom that choked it off, which was all the dust and everything that's getting ground up on our roads and probably a lot of nitrogen from lawn clippings, dead animals, you name it, it's getting ground up. You know, I think I've talked to you before that the roads are sort of like a grist mill, like you took whole grains and you ground it to make flour. And that's what's happening here. And that sediment got in there and choked it off. And then the game fish, your bass, your bluegill and, and stuff that ate insects and so on, so on top of the water, they would just disappear. And then you had copy, uh, uh, some other fish that came from other areas, maybe bottom feeders like catfish that could kind of hang in there. Some types of like uh, snake fish and, and bow fish is really, and they live in there, but really, uh, the top apex predators in there, they went away because the bottoms got choked off. Um, and that was happening in Tampa Bay also because you have uh, probably the most densely populated areas that are surrounding Tampa Bay. They're, everything you got is going straight through a pipe, a concrete line, clay line pipe. It's not, no sediment, no nothing is coming out of this stuff. 
it just goes straight into the bay. After a 4th of July, I used to go fishing that next day and all the outlet pipes would be nothing but the wrappers and packaging and sticks from fireworks. And you know, as it is now, 4th of July is huge. New Year, it's just huge. And you should have seen what, what you see outside of these pipes because in 4th of July, it always seemed had a big rain would happen, you know, and all that stuff is going straight into the bay. Uh, matter of fact, they put the barges out there and shoot hundreds and thousands of tons of gunpowder and explosives and all these chemicals that are in to make all these colors they're all you know dyes and stuff over the water so for not burning up and saving land all that tons you just look at how much goes and how much comes back nothing comes back it all gets shot over the water but i'm sorry i went off on that that doesn't it's not, it's, it's, one of many things that's happening to the water, I believe. No, but, it's, it's still definitely but, relevant. Um, and then, so you kind of mentioned what happened to freshwater systems, right? Um, now, uh, can you speak a little bit more about um, about the saltwater issues? Um, so, what what have you seen in terms of species? Um, in terms of the, the same things were happening in saltwater. All seagrass was coming back because you took out a lot of the nutrient influence from human waste, but still. I would say now it's dog waste. I mean, I think there's some studies. If, if you were to look in Pinellas County alone of how much dog food is brought in through all the stores, what you can get on Amazon and everything, by the tonnage, it would be literally freight cars. And a large chunk of that, you know, I'm saying 25, 30 something percent of that protein, all this, you know, solid. Uh, nutrients makes its way back into the water because everybody's got dogs and so not everybody picks up their stuff and it's you know uh that is probably one of the largest nutrient influences in storm all these i mean they're doing more retention and detention type ponds but that's focused on it's the only way they can control stuff, the government, city of St. Pete, is they control the private sector. You want to build a Walmart, you got to have a retention or detention type of water system for your parking lot. It can't flow out in the street. It can't flow this way. It can't flow that way. And so they got to contain it. And so in the commercial sector that way, that's being handled pretty good. They're paying for everything. Now, go to government itself. There is a fertilizer ban for at least the nitrates in the three components of fertilizer during the rainy season in the summer in Pinellas County. Yet, golf courses, colleges, government who own large tracts of everything are still using pallets and pallets of the fertilizer that has everything in it. They don't, these bans are for the public user, not these big sectors and and one sort of irony is we lived as you know right next to saint pete college now i'm growing a garden da, 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 and i use some synthetic fertilizers i'm not totally organic but i cannot buy fertilizer that's got nitrogen in it but i watched the college which you know joined my property with nothing but ammonia nitrate just basically uh in their spreaders pulled by little tractors that spread a 18 foot wide path going down a strip between sidewalk, street gutter curb, that's six feet and it spreads it. I could go out there and take a broom and, a, and shovel up literal uh, pounds of this stuff that was making its way, uh, same out here, uh, the roadways leading up to Don Cesar. I used to come out of wade fishing out of there, climb on the seawall and look around the palm trees where the maintenance guys going down, taking a coffee can full of fertilizer and just dumping it on an incline of about 30 something degrees right into the seawall, right into the drink. So any rain, that stuff goes right back into it. So what we have happening now is it's not, it, it's 
the, the government, the, the large parcels, golf courses, all these things that own really big pieces of manicured property, because we want all our, look at St. Pete uh, College, and you look at all your colleges, and they're all, they're all pristine, beautiful, green grass, edge concrete. Now, uh, you can't have it both ways, you know. That just needs, you know, uh, what we call weeds is just a flower in the wrong place in a sense. So it's funny that in the higher education places where they're trying to teach young guys like yourself about environments and this and that, if you look at actually what they got, it don't match. You know, a little hypocritical is, is my point. So uh, um, how do you, so have these, how, what changes have you noticed in terms of, uh, um, so, um, how, so how has fishing changed over the course of your lifetime, right? What practices, locations, or species have fallen in our favor and why? And how do you think that relates to water quality? Do you think certain species have been, um, have increased because of um, improvements or, or lack thereof in water quality? I mean, how, how, has, the, how has the fishing changed because of that? In, in the experience that I've had, I can speak about Tampa Bay, Bogusiega Bay, and the Gulf immediately around Pinellas, Hillsborough, and Sarasota counties. Um, and it probably started back in 70 to 72 was the first gigantic red tide that killed fish that was bigger than us at the time. And the fish kills were phenomenal with the red tide. They were just unbelievable the amount of fish makes today's red tides that they have minuscule in comparison. You literally couldn't go fishing after it for years. Now, but because nature's always seeking balance, that the dead fish would degrade and fall back through the water column on the bottom, that would start a gigantic population in the crustaceans, your shrimp, your crabs, which then excel your trout, flounder, uh, pinfish, baitfish, all these things. And so it would come back up. And so over time, you know, with the large fish kills that they had like that, uh, it would be almost nothing to be caught for, for years, to be honest with you. You just give up fishing. You got, you got to go hunt. You got to do something else. That's not going to happen. And I think that's accelerated itself. I think red tide's a natural, well, we know it's a natural phenomenon. I think it gets its start from the Saharan dust layers. And I think at one time, Florida's benign system, as far as nutrients, didn't have a lot of nutrients in Florida. You know, you get real swampy areas, yeah. But most of it, pine, scrub, you know, flatwoods and whatnot, that water's pretty clean flowing through there, except for tannic acids. That's the only color it had on springs and all this stuff. And so it was that Saharan dust that would come across, it feeds the Amazon, fed Florida. And that would start red tides. But red tides now, they're made so much more. Uh, the water temperatures are staying up in the water for long periods. There's, I don't remember a freeze down there now in a decade that I know of. I mean, we didn't even have frost the last five or six years that I knew of. And as a kid, we had, I seen snow in Florida. It was not uncommon in December back in the 60s and early 70s to have teens and 20 degree weather. So that's definitely influenced it to some degree there. But the fishing has come and gone, come and gone. And then now uh, they've had some massive red tides again. And the funny thing is, because it goes back to money, so all these dead fish, nobody wants to look at. Everybody wants to live on the water, but you don't want to look at a bunch of dead fish. So they're paying people to pick up the fish. And I'll allude back, nature always seeks balance. The fish wouldn't go to waste. It's going to be an eyesore and a smelly proposition for the people that live near it. But by removing them and putting wherever they're putting them, they're not letting nature take care of it. Because they would, you would have a big shrimp population, crab population, because we shrimped every year in the winters, you know, after a red tide. And I mean, you would get shrimp that would be eight count. Eight shrimp would equal a pound. They were like mini lobsters. And we knew it. Any local person knew red tide's a bad thing now. <sighs> but you wait till November in the winter when them low tides are out there and you could go out off a of skyway and they, you could look out there and you would just be going, oh, man, the eyes would be bulging on these guys, you know, shrimp that big. 
but 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 anyways nature always seeks balance um now you know if you look at fishing now tampa bay's off you go on the florida what you know w uh, uh, uh wildlife commission sites you can't keep nothing there you know off of Punt Ellis county and because you've had what 2017 red tide 2018 and then we just had another one um and in the recent red tide it had well not the last one but 17 there was a mixture of green and red algae uh you still have a huge problem over there in Piney Point or Apollo Beach or lower southeast Tampa Bay, where there is huge abandoned phosphate gyp piles from the fertilizer industry, which was huge and still is huge port. Tampa is mosaic, right? And well, it you get these inundated rains and stuff like that, and. Till they fix that, Tampa Bay is going down in fish population because they still have this pile. I don't know how many acres this thing is uh, from an aerial thing. It's huge. Uh, so th the fishing has gone down, I would say accelerated ever since we haven't had the last freeze. So the last decade, it's, it's on its way down. So, uh, so if you can talk about those uh, kind of phosphate piles a little bit more, right? Because uh, I know Mosaic, um, big, you know, mining kind of like corporation over there, right? Um, and they have a lot of it. They've been causing a lot of issues with groundwater, you know, as they kind of inject their stuff into it, right? But uh, yeah, if you can kind of just explain how the runoff from there affects the red tide, I would appreciate it a little well, more. They, they're... They're, the EPA is much bigger than it ever was now, and they're not allowed to do the same things. So the new processes aren't as bad. What we're, what we're looking at is the old 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s left their, their abandoned. I don't know if it was Mosaic or who owns the one track, but I think once you get to that side all the way across the state, they're huge these pits, you know, in these storage areas. Well, it rains so much that they're worried about these tanks holding this stuff rupturing and having just a complete on, you know, millions of gallons of this directly into the bay because it's right there at sea level. You're at sea level. You've got a couple of feet, maybe. That's it. So in order to keep it from bursting, they have to let it out. In 2011, they put it on a barge. They took it out and pumped it out. Now they're just pumping it into Cockroach Bay, Apollo Beach down there. And that's what's fueled your uh, red tide this last year, but even more so. Down below, Tampa Bay comes out, the Florida, uh, 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 the, the water movement along Florida's west coast is to the south. And uh, it, so it takes Tampa Bay, dumps it out. If you look at an aerial, it's just dark water and it's just rolling around Egmont Key, Anna Maria and going south. And off of Sarasota, I would say down to Punta Gorda, there's a dead hole. It's been like that 30, 40 years, you know? So everything moving south coming out of Tampa Bay has had a lot of issues for a long period of time. Um, and those plants and stuff, they cannot be helping it. But it's it's never one thing. It's always a whole bunch of things that causes these disasters. But it can be triggered because the level of nutrients are up so high. We had a lot of Saharan dust this year. So it's right here doing its natural thing, the red tide. But then you dump this thing out, oh, it's not. You're just, boom, crosses that line. And probably the temperature of the water it's not getting cold enough to kill anything out during the winter. So it kind of still lingering and festering during winter. And once summer comes and it's back to not, you know, 88 degrees, 24 hours a day, it's kicking off. So kind of just elaborating on, so you've mentioned climate change a couple of times, right? And how you've seen the effects of climate change kind of really within your lifetime. Um, you know, so what? So if you can just elaborate on climate change's role, um, like a little bit more in the entire process of this. I mean, and what do you foresee going forward, kind of based on what you've seen um, previously? It's tough for nature to get a balance back where we stand. The 
warming of our atmosphere is multifaceted also. If you look at St. Pete itself, when I was a kid, it rained every day, two or three o'clock in the afternoon. It rolled in from the east, rolled across, unbelievable lightning, cooled everything off. Now you have so much, this is something I've, I've never heard anybody really talk about this, but as a building inspector, I've sat on top of Tyrone Wall in the middle of July, looking out at the heat signature coming off, you know, that mall in that area, you, pretty much the entire county. Concrete, asphalt, roof material, building material, there's no green. All those materials that we have out just unbelievable amounts from Tampa everywhere. Look at Tampa, look at these cities. They create their own high pressure dome. Same thing they have happen out here in California in the valleys and stuff like that. The heat absorbs back into the concrete. You don't get any cooling during the night and it's radiated back out. Now you have from uh, the, the ozone deteriorating from greenhouse gases and whatnot from burning old photoplankton from oil, which that's what it is. It's not dinosaurs. This is all, you know, algae from millions of years ago. And now you're bringing all that atmospheric from back, you know, millions of years, you bring it back in atmosphere in copious amounts. So you can't help but reproduce what you had back then. Be honest with you. And so all these things are layering on top, but if you go, it doesn't rain. You can watch the rain coming from the East. It hits St. Pete that high pressure dome, it just goes around. You notice Funnels Park right here, that one little green, it always rains and floods there. Yet in St. Pete, where I'm sitting there by Tyrone Mall, that drop, nothing. But you, you see it coming, it just, just, it just dries it up. High pressure, it's way up in the atmosphere. Nothing can build. It needs the barometer to drop, it needs the pressure to drop, build and all that moisture. Now you have to have a hurricane or a front I mean, or stronger, you know, storms that come and can defeat the high pressure. Now you get some cloudiness going on with all that concrete and asphalt laying absorbing heat. You can keep rain going. So when it does start rain, don't stop. You know, because it, it, that's not raining all the time. So all that humidity is in the atmosphere. It's built up, and it's just going to let go until the heat dome builds back again. So if you look at these areas, especially from an aerial, all the city's temperatures are way higher. Than the rural area that I'm at now, you know, they don't they don't cool off at night, you know. So um, if you can kind of just elaborate a little bit more about your experience as a building inspector, right, and how maybe that's going to influence kind of the way you kind of perceive the way, not only the way the city runs, right, but the way uh, you kind of you kind of view these environmental issues kind of taking place. So uh, I mean, so like, what major projects have you worked on, right, and also. Uh, what have you seen as, as a city inspector that either gives you hope for the future or kind of like, or helps you kind of realize why the issues kind of exist the way they exist in the first place? Uh, I don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, but a lot of what I've seen in the bureaucracy, you just never use good people. Uh, it's either nepotism, cronyism, it's an ism. Because really you want to surround yourself with people that think like you and they're not going to cause you problems. I remember probably the first year I was with the city of St. Pete, they asked me if I brought my own life jacket uh, because I had a tendency to run off with what I thought I was seeing happening. But anyways, to go back to projects, um, I worked on sewage treatment plants, which is the one on 54th Avenue, which is probably the largest sewage treatment plant uh, on the west coast of Florida, probably all the way to Louisiana, I'm thinking it was huge and it was state of the art. And it was, uh, although the technology has been out there a long time. And so it's massive and it's a really good system. Um, I did big stadium projects. Uh, I kind of left and went to the city when they went to do Raymond James Stadium, but I did do the, what was called the Ice Palace in Tampa. So Tampa was going through this revitalization. But before that, I did what they had the Florida Aquarium. I was the head layout engineer. In other words, I was the survey crew that laid out all those windows you see when you go through the forested wetlands and you go through where they show the ecosystem. It's a it's a whole ring and you're actually going up in elevation. I laid all of them out. 
Um, and so that was a really neat project because in the 500,000 gallon saltwater tank depicting like deep water golf, Mexico type fish and corals and whatnot, they made their own ozone. So we had a tower there to make ozone to supply uh, that large tank in the salt water. And so that was pretty neat. And, and so I got to work on some big projects that were really neat and you learn because you're, it's experience it really. Um, going to the city of St. Pete, there was no way you could bring a good idea to flotation because we as humans have huge egos. So a lot of people wouldn't represent your idea because of their ego, because it's not their idea. And I think your generation, if you can get away from this, knock the monkey off your back and go with something and hash out differences of opinions and things, so you can actually come up with something. And then sometimes there's too many cooks in the kitchen. So it's just going to taste like crap no matter what you do. Uh, so a lot of good ideas never would happen because it wasn't the boss's idea. And I think in government and, and people in longstanding jobs, you get comfortable. You don't want to stir the pot. You just want your life to be easy and so on. It's a human tendency for that to happen. You know, there's very few people you're going to find that kind of live on the edge a little bit. They're always looking like, you know, they're, they're super energetic. They're super passionate about things and they're always working. Those people are far and few in between. You just have the run of the mill, everybody, you know, the lemmings, <laughs> I should say that, um, that get in line and do what they're told and so on and so forth. So I felt in the 20 years I was with the city, I was never tapped for any of my experience with anything. I would, because they seen me, they viewed me because I would bring up things like, I'm telling a contractor, you have to have a silk fence. You got to put up containment. Your muddy water is not coming out of that site. You're going to do this, this, and that. But they would let the contractor start a job, start driving piling, start pouring concrete, and then send me out there to look at their site. When you should be doing is go to the site before they ain't put a shovel in the ground not even for the ceremonial gold shovel. Oh, we're going to build this. And I should be out there going, what's your plan for containment? Nope, that won't work. Because I know my city, my town, my elevations. You got to do, I'm going to give you some options. You got to do this, this, or this. And so you, you don't build up your site. You keep your site down. So you, when it rains, you're in the mud hole. The mud hole ain't flowing down coffee pot boulevard right into the drink which is what i seen happening and so you bring these ideas to them and they and you couldn't get anybody to move on it look you know we need to be out there before these guys start after that are you going to shut down a you know 400 million dollar project starting out you're going to shut them down to get their site right no they're not going to do that because it would make publicity it would make bad media it would get bad attention so People complain, you go out there and talk to people and threaten them with fees, but they don't care. I've had them pay $500 a day. Wouldn't, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. Can't. It's too late. So the idea of, of getting ahead of something, we always wait for the problem to arise rather than get there before the, the, the problem. But, but once again, it was hard to bring new ideas to the city uh, because it wasn't their idea. That's how that's what I see, you know. It, it, I'm telling the job site, you got to contain your job. Yet down the way, the city's working on roads and got a 40 foot muck pile on top of a culvert that has a fish logo on it. And it says, this goes directly into the bay. <laughs> so I'd go, look, I got the, you know, who points this out? The contractors on beating up on the site going, look, Gene, we've done everything. Our site's tight. But you look at the cities out there trying to bring in a pipe to us. Look at their mound of muck. Do you see the box? And I would take pictures of this and bring them to my supervisor. You know, it's really hard for me to, you know, control the contractor when he's looking out there. 
the city felt as though they could just do what they wanted to do. So it was a bunch of hypocrisy there. We hurt ourselves more. The private sector is held to a standard that most governments, uh, municipalities and whatnot are not. People think everybody's looking at this. They're not, nobody's looking at it. That's a really interesting point how, uh, because I mean, conventional wisdom kind of almost thinks that it's the opposite, right? That like, you would think the government kind of has more oversight over what it does compared to the private sector. But uh, from your experience, obviously that's not the case. So it, that's and let me just say one thing. If you were to go to St. Pete to Janus Landing, where all the bars and restaurants are that really was remade, you know, in the 2000s, and, you know, and it's now everybody, it's a neat vibe and all this. Go in the alleys behind all these restaurants. There's cobblestone alleys that are really, really old, and they're not going to go in and tear these things up. And you have culvert boxes with steel grates. And back there, and you've been in the restaurant business, you got all the grease going in bins, you got all the dumpsters leaking everything you can imagine. The little martini straws, the little straws you, and lemon wedges, you could look in the box after a rain with all the restaurants back in here, and it was just full of lemon wedges, full. So all this stuff is coming out. It's going into the alley, and in the first drink, it's only a 1,000 feet or less. And you're out by that big millions of dollars worth of beer. So they're worried about the artwork and the pier. But all up and down First Avenue, Central Avenue, and where all this stuff is, there is ancient, out-of-date concrete pipe and grates that anything that falls in it goes straight to the bay. So that's, that's you know... So we're willing to look at everybody involved and hold everybody accountable for, including the entity that regulates everything. Who's looking at the regulator? You know. And so I used to go there with the plumbing inspector and look at it. And there's one more little pocket. Just go this. The city was always big in the media about green building, and so they built a water plant which houses all the administrative staff. State of the art, we're gonna use the gray water system. Gray water is using uh, uh, treated wastewater and collected rainwater and stuff like that to flush and do all this. And man, they put millions of dollars in this stuff in all kinds of buildings. And as a building inspector, my one of my best buddies was a you know, a 50-year plumbing guy that knew this stuff like that. So we watched these sites come out of the ground at the end. We're, I'm, we're doing finals. And so what's happening is they're trying to get the buildings up and running. They're using the gray water. Well, reclaimed water's got a terrible smell and it'll grow algae within 24 hours. So everywhere these tanks and this stuff coming into the building, the whole building smelled like a sewage treatment plant. So nobody figured on these things. And so it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to do, you have to treat it with, a, with uh, chlorine. <laughs> You're back to that. You got it? So we were doing, we would go out here, we were at the water building, we would look, they put the artwork uh, um, out there on the front, spend all this money. Me and the guys on the ground, we we're looking at the valve box and go, holy crap, the reclaim shut off and the potable's on. So they just did a big, huge news media thing with the three $25,000 dragonfly artwork out front look at us look what we built oh it's green we use our own water me and ken bradbury are looking at the box going that valve is definitely off the potable water coming from our aquifers it's on they're not using any of it so it ends up being like a media thing that they put out there for everybody look a feel-good moment now everybody goes oh that's just great oh look what we're doing same with a lot of schools that they did um, in the challenge area on the south side. Uh, they put these big elaborate systems in. They couldn't hire anybody that could operate them because they were too sophisticated. So they shut the valves off. That's what I see. I look right at it. I know when a valve's on or it's off. You know, your potable water's on. 
<laughs> the, the reclaim water or what you're supposed to be using the gray water is off. But anyways. So to kind of wrap this interview up, right? Um, what do you think can ultimately what do you think can ultimately be done to uh, you know improve water quality or to kind of solve these kind of issues and, or the what, what approach can we take going into the future? Um, and everything kind of being said. All these outfalls, all these discharge pipes, they need to go into some retention or detention type ponds. They need to get filtered out. Where water meets land, we can't have seawalls. We need mangroves. It's got to go through seagrass or, or, or above ground type of grasses and, 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 and floral, you know, uh, uh, sea grapes and mangroves, all three types and all the grasses and oysters and all that. It needs to be trickling out over that before it goes in. It can't have all these slick line pipes and seawalls because that's where the water, that's where your real estuary is. That's so it, we're not filtering anything. So they got the money because they can spend the money in our work. Don't get me wrong. I love art. It's not that. It's just that It'd be nicer to see the bay doing the flourishing fish and whatnot, you know, happening than to look at some tarps they put up for artwork that in the first hurricanes going to be a big mess, you know, to put the money in all those pipes, they need to dig those areas up. If you don't start, I know they're in green areas and, and the city's done a great job of maintaining green areas along the waterways because of money, because everybody loves to look at it. But the truth is, all them pipes running there, they're, you know, it's a monumental task to go and start ripping this stuff up. But it, and they're lining pipes and they're doing a lot of things. But that the outfall, it needs to be elevations, weirs, different things for settlement and affluence to get it out, not a direct shot into the bay. And that has to do with Upper Hillsborough Bay and all the things that are draining in. We're lining them with concrete to make them go fast because we don't want it to flood, you know? And so we're creating all these algae blooms and the, and the water's heating up. And now when you get a rain event, it's a monumental event because no high pressure, the low pressure builds in and it's doing it all at one time. Nature's going, well, if I can't get my rain on a daily basis, I'll get it once a year. So if you're averaging 32 inches, well, you might have a three-day rain and you're going to get your 32 inches. So nature seeks balance. And if you can't let it do its thing, there shouldn't be anybody on the water right on. There should be a buffer, you know, and then everybody can go visit it and, and, and whatnot. Fantastic. Well, uh, those are all the questions I have for you today, Mr. Rooney. Um, is there anything you, uh, you want to kind of leave um, the listeners off with? There is always the opportunity to help nature balance itself um, with your generation and newer generations of uh, that are carrying the baggage of the past like myself and maybe getting hired by municipalities and allowed to not let egos and emotions get in the way of solid choices. I mean, you can't kill the economy along the lines of doing these things. So they would have to be, you know, maybe pieced out here and there to get it better. Um, because you're just not going to go and tear up all the roads all at one time to start changing all these pipes. And that's really what St. Pete's at. It's not like they don't want to do it. I give them credit. They're, the, the, their mind is in the right place. It's just the implementation, you know, getting it implemented to do is, 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 is a difficult task. And I think it's that way for all uh, water bodied municipalities around the state of Florida, but Florida's population is growing by leaps and bounds and you know, humans, nature doesn't want any one organism to take over anything. And so it, 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 instead of concentrated areas where everybody's living in, there probably needs to be more space, you know, and that's the only thing. But I think that the, the thinking is to put, to develop areas, keep a lot of green space and then concentrate all the people. That's what I see, you know so that you have the green space. So I don't know if it's better to do that or to have people dispersed and have more green space between them. 
I think more of the newer construction is really falling in line that would help the ecosystem and the system, you know, that it's mainly the old stuff that's kind of hurting you. And population growth in those areas makes it really difficult to get anything done because you can't rely on the, the, the experienced people. you got new people coming in. You're bringing them all in. So you got a person that's been there two years and go, you know, it's never flooded since I've been here till yesterday. You know, and they've only been there for three or four years. So and so you're pretty much in a flood area when you're next to any body of water. So and that's about it, Billy. Well, um. I really appreciate your time, Mr. Rooney.